Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. I am board certified with every one of those institutions that you see in there. I'm board, sir, I am endorsed by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, since been, have been endorsed since the year 2010. Um, things have changed a lot from the time I was endorsed. One of the things that happened for me is uh, they lost my paperwork in the office five times. <laughs> Not just once. No, five times they lost my paperwork. <laughs> Uh, but things have changed tremendously. We now have, I think we have an, what, what I would call the dream team working at the office. We have an awesome team working for the chaplains in the nation. Uh, so I'm endorsed by Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries. I'm board certified by the Association of Professional Chaplains. Also by the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy. And I'm the chair of the certification board for Adventist Chaplaincy Ministries, which is, um, I mean, Adventist Chaplaincy Institute, which is the certification board for the Seventh-day Adventist worldwide, by the way. We are already certifying chaplains all over the world. We have, bo we board certified a chaplain in the Philippines last year and a chaplain in, um, in Africa, in Kenya, Africa also certified somebody there and we are working on certifications with many, many places, many different places. And I think, <laughs> and I think, I think we will have the first Canadian board certified chaplain pretty soon. I am speaking prophetically. <laughs> I am speaking prophetically because I think we're going to get David in. He did turn in his paperwork. He did turn in his certification to me earlier today, so I think we're going to get this pretty soon. <clears throat> I've learned very quickly in my, in my career that um, I always tell a joke before I start. So if you allow me, indulge me in telling this joke with you guys. There was this guy who was blessed to survive this awesome and huge flood. I mean, it was huge and, 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 and it was something very important for him. He survived this flood and he was very thankful to God and to every, you know, to, especially to God that he was able to survive this flood. And so every time he spoke, he spoke about surviving this flood. He got invited to preach at different churches. Although he wasn't a pastor, he would go over there and he would find somehow a way to make a connection between the sermon he was preaching with God delivering him from that flood. Now remember, this is a joke, so please do not throw theology back at me. <laughs> he dies and goes to heaven. And when he gets to heaven, he sees Jesus and he says, Lord, I'm so thankful that you helped me survive this flood. I am so thankful that I would, you know what, I would like to have a meeting with people. Maybe, um, you know, beside the sea of glass, we can have a meeting and I would love to tell them what it meant for me to survive a flood. Jesus looks at him and says, I think we could do some about that. So, long story short, about three days later, Jesus comes back to him and says, Yeah, I have about 3,000 people who have signed up to go hear you talk about <laughs> the surviving of the flood. Okay, good. Um, so, there will be a meeting next Sabbath afternoon at 3 p.m. under the tree of life. <laughs> I, and you will have a chance to share surviving the flood with them. Oh, thank you so much, Lord. I just want to give you a word of caution. Yes, Noah is going to be there. <laughs> a reminder to myself that whenever I do a presentation, there may be someone in the audience that knows more about what I'm talking about than me. So that brings, keeps me humble and grounded. <clears throat> I am honored to share with you some of the professional standards of chaplaincy. And let me start from the very beginning 
Bill already shared with you some of this. But I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hone in a little bit more on that. Number 1. According to the church policy, chaplains are professional pastors. Which I'm going to say it in a different way. I'm sorry guys in the camera, I do move a lot. <laughs> I'm going to say this in a different way. Every chaplain must be a pastor, but not every pastor can be a chaplain. Are you with me? Every chaplain must be a pastor, but not every pastor can be a chaplain. I'll give you an example. I told you I'm a, I'm a fourth generation Adventist. My dad is a pastor. He was actually the ministerial director of um, the ministerial director of the Inter-American Division until 2005 until he retired. And when he retired, he came to shadow me when I, where I was working as a pastor, as a chaplain. Because he was of the old mind that those who can't pastor chaplain. Yes. So he came to shadow me because he wanted, yeah, I'm retired, maybe I can do this chaplaincy thing. I got him a batch <laughs> at Florida Hospital and got him the, per the necessary permits for him to go visit with patients and, and so forth. Um, two hours into the day, my dad says, I can't take this anymore, take me back home. <laughs> and I did that for 16 years. I did bedside chaplaincy for 16 years. What am I saying then? What I'm saying is that not everybody has the heart, not everybody has the training, not everybody has what, it, what is needed to be a chaplain. And it's okay, it doesn't say that the person who doesn't have it is some sort of a failed pastor or something. It just, see, it just says that that's probably not their gift. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> as I talk about chaplaincy competencies, um, I have I have a handout that I want to give you guys. I'm not going to give it to you right now because you're going to start reading the handout and not paying attention to what I'm saying. So I'll give it to you later on. Is that okay? Yes. Now, I'm going to talk about the chaplaincy competencies. Um, because what other, uh, I was having a conversation with the, with the ministerial de, uh, department in the North American Division. I'm inviting them to be a part observers of the process of certification now. So some of them are coming to be a part of the certification boards that we are doing. How many pastors, after they're ordained, they have completed their education, they have to write between 50 and 70 pages talking about each one of the 31 competencies of chaplaincy. They have to write, not only that, they have to write their autobiography. They also have to write two clinical cases where they demonstrate competency. And then they send that information to five pastors who read that and then they drill them for an hour and a half deciding, deciding if they're going to be board certified or not. Mm. That's the process. That's what we go through, those of us who are board certified. So, um, I'm sharing this and some of them were saying, man, I think we need to start doing this a little bit more with our pastors. Rather than, for example, rather than asking our pastors before ordination, how many revelation seminars have you given? Mm -hmm. Or how many baptisms have you done? What about asking them, what is the theology that undergirds your ministry? Mm -hmm. Tell me, how does your theology affect the way you treat people? Because after all, that's what ministry is about, right? So we're going to talk about these things. I'm going to talk about the competencies of chaplaincy. A certain preamble here. Number one, a chaplaincy care is grounded in, look at this, initiating, developing, Deepening, deepening and bringing to an appropriate close a mutual and empathic relationship with those receiving care. This is important. This is mutual and what's the key word here? Empathic. It's not sympathic. And it's based on this idea 
especially in one of the books that we, all ch we chaplains all have to read. It's called The Wounded Healer by Henry J. M. Nowen. Have you ever read that book? Look for it. Maybe a good thing for you to read it. So in The Wounded Healer, Henry J. M. Nowen says, that, by the way, he's a Catholic priest. So there's a pa Seventh-day Adventist pastor uh, recommending Catholic priest literature. Uh, anyways, <laughs> let me just stop there for a minute. <clears throat> he says, when we entered into someone's pain, there is a great probability that we will touch our own pain. And the wounded healer, the wounded healer by Henry J. M. Nowen, N O U W E N. So this is a mutual and empathic, empathic relationship with those receiving care, and this is important. There is a process. You initiate, develop, deepen, and bring to an appropriate close. This is not just I came, I dropped the bomb, and I left. No, it says, I come, I initiate the relationship, I develop the relationship, I deepen the relationship, and I close it appropriately. All of this underlined by the fact that there has to be some empathic relationship here. So think about it. If I was empathic, would I go to a grieving mother who is crying for the death of their son and go, um, where's your faith, sister? Or would I go, like, I, the, like the story I shared, to a grieving old lady in a nursing home and say, stop crying for your dog. The dog, dogs don't have souls, so they're not going to heaven or hell, whatever. They're not going to be saved. If I was empathic, would I say something like that? <coughs> Second, the development of a genuine relationship is at the core of chaplaincy care and underpins, even enables all the other dimensions of chaplaincy care to, call, to occur. So what's the most important thing here? This is a relational profession. That's perhaps one of the reasons why I, I, I love to talk about pastoral ministry in terms of the, of the idea that I find in Spanish. Why? Because in Spanish there is no difference between the concept of pastor and shepherd. It's the same word. It's the same concept. Can I be a shepherd away from my flock? Can I be a shepherd to the sheep, keeping them an arm's length away from me? But who has the time to keep them sheep? They're so needy. They keep asking for things, calling me in the middle of the night for stupid things. I, I, when I started ministry, I got a phone call. One, a family, you know, a family called me once to go and bathe their dog. <laughs> they called the pastor because nobody at home was, had courage enough to go bathe their dog who was sick. So they called the pastor. I did. <laughs> and that says a lot about me. <laughs> so it is a relational thing. A genuine relationship. And it is assumed that the standards are addressed within the context of such a relationship. So I want you to understand that this is relational ministry. This is relational profession, right? And the standards that we do are always within this practice, this relationship. We cannot take the standards away from that because if they're away from that relationship thing, then they're just a piece, uh, a bunch of words. 
With me? Yes, sir. May I ask, why is there such a large differentiation in the requirements for chaplaincy as compared to pastoral ministry? Is there some kind of... Because the idea is that, chapl is that chaplaincy is a post-pastoral specialty. Think about it this way. I don't know how it is here in Canada, but in, 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 Amer in the United States, um, my brother went to medical school, graduated as a physician, you know, MD, medical doctor, with a general practitioner practice, uh, uh, license. But then he decided that he wanted to be a surgeon. So he was a specialty, he has a surgery specialty within the profession of medicine. And then within the surgery specialty, he did two more. He did bariatrics and non-invasive. So he is a surgeon who started as a doctor, became a surgeon, and now he does bariatrics and non-invasive surgery. It's the same thing with chaplains. Chaplains, we started as pastors, and then we took the specialty of chaplaincy. And there are some of us, like Bill, for example, he's a specialized military chaplain. I am a specialized healthcare chaplain. Yes. Yeah, as a chaplain, though, as some of us, you know, for example, the uh, specialization in treatment and care, uh, you know, in thanatology. Exactly. And, uh, you know, exactly. Some, uh, have specialization in dementia care, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's a different type of thing. Mm -hmm. And even in programming itself, and for there's example in Park Manor, we uh, just don't do the usual program, you know. As a chaplain, for example, we do a different type of program that's more psycho-emotionally supportive, you know. <laughs> And, and I'm going to go as far as to say, for example, now the, the certification organizations are even going as far as to providing specialty certification. So you go and get board certified as a regular chaplain, but you can also get board certified as a thanatology chaplain or as beyond that, is beyond the, the original certification. You can go as a certified grief chaplain or a certified uh, palliative care chaplain. Yeah. Etc. So, it is a post uh, post pastoral specialty. Good question. Good question. Can I move on? All right. So, <coughs> the 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 standards of care are divided into three sections. As a, as chaplains, professionally speaking, and by the way. These standards are universal to all the organizations that provide certification. In other words, the Association of Professional Chaplains in the United States, the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy in the United States and the rest of the world, Adventist Chaplaincy Institute in the United States and the rest of the world, and the Canadian Institute of Spiritual Care have the same standards of care. That's, what, that's part of what you have in there, what I'm bringing to you guys. So you can see the documentation that is written by those organizations about that. So, first thing is, oops, I'm sorry. First thing is assessment. I'm going to put it this way. He who doesn't know where he is going, he's already there. <laughs> that's how my dad put it. Yes, sir. Pastor at Henderson 20 years back or so, uh, if you aim at nothing, you're bound to hit it. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you aim at nothing, you're bound to hit it. Be in nothing. I'm going to develop this idea a little bit more, more further down the line. But in other words, chaplains are half, uh, chaplains, and by the way, pastors in general. Why? Because you don't simply stand behind the pulpit to preach on a Sabbath morning without knowing where you want to take your congregation with you, right? And knowing where you want to take your congregation with you required a little bit of assessment where the congregation is. Right? So that's assessment. Then you also have delivery of care. In other words, how do you provide for that thing that you are identifying? 
Let me give you an image, an image that probably will help you understand this. Have you ever, ever had a back uh, itch? You ever had one of those? And you can't reach it. And then you ask your spouse, your wife, to scratch you, but she is so worried about something else that she's scratching everywhere except where you needed to be scratched. How's that feeling? Describe it. Huh? Frustrating. Frustrating? What else? But how do you feel when finally she gets to the, pl to the point where it's needed? Well, that is exactly what I'm talking about with the delivery of care here. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. You go exactly to where it's needed and you scratch the, where it's needed. All right? But this is not only that. When you are in an institution and you are providing care, let me see the chaplains that are here. If it's not charted, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> it never happened. So you have to document. And by the way, this is the interesting thing. Pastors who are pastors in churches. Has this ever happened to you? This happened to me um, some time ago. Uh, in a church that shall remain nameless. <laughs> I, I'm sitting down a Wednesday evening. We went to prayer meeting with my family. And the pastor of the church stood up to preach. And he started to preach a sermon, and I started to hear that what he was saying was something I thought, I think I heard before. And then my daughter, who was 13 years at the time, turned to me and said, Dad, I think he's preached that sermon like nine times already. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't document that you've already preached that sermon, you may end up... Uh, anyways. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> So document care. Document that you, what you do. And then teamwork and collaboration. This is the interesting thing. We pastors tend to be lone wolves. But if you have this team approach to the things that you do, think about how things will change. Just think about how things would change in, a, in your church setting if you do this. If you sit down with your church members on Monday, you have a group of four or five group mem church members on Monday, and then you talk about what are the needs of the church, think about what would that mean in your sermon preparation. But now think about how do you do this in a healthcare organization, when you sit with people, had a, I had a meeting with a doctor who was very frustrated about a Jehovah Witness patient who was refusing blood transfusion and blood products. Very, very frustrated. So I sat with him, because we have this team approach thing, sat with him and started asking. So let me ask you something, doc. What do you think the blood means for this person. I need you to change the way you're thinking. You're thinking right now as a physician. You want to do something to save that person. And that's perfect. But now I need you to think from their perspective. What does that mean? I don't know, Chaplain. What does that mean? And then I told him, you know that if he accepts blood transfusion, he's going to be shunned by his church. So this is more a matter of salvation for him. You are trying to save his life. He's trying to save his soul. <laughs> Can we come together and talk? I mean, reg regardless of how stupid this means, this seems to everybody. And trust me, I don't believe what they believe. But it's not my job to judge them. My job is to advocate for him, as well to advocate to, for the physician. So can I help them to get on the same page? Are you with me now? Yeah. That's teamwork. That's teamwork and collaboration. 
And then also that leads me to ethical practice. What is ethics? In the context of care, whether at church or in the, in, in, in the conference or anywhere, what is ethics? Can I, can I be honest with you? For example, that pastor that I'm talking about of that church that shall remain nameless, he was so jealous of me that, you know what that guy decided to do? He was convinced that I was not a good Seventh-day Adventist. Therefore, he hired a private investigator to follow me around. And the guy was so stupid, because there is no other way to put it, he brings the bill from the PI to the church treasurer, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> Sorry about this. brings the bill from the PI to my wife. Every quarter we had communion and every time you could see it was you could set the clock to this. Friday before communion he would come to my house to ask me for forgiveness and we will patch things up and pray and things like that. Sabbath morning we had communion Sabbath afternoon, he had a fight with me again. <laughs> and then I get a phone call from the, ministerial, from the ministerial director of the conference. He had complained about some things about me, and they were exploring re uh, taking away my credentials. I explained what had happened, and the ministerial director just laughed and brush it off. But that is what I would call spiritual religious abuse. As a matter of fact, did you know that the DSM-5 includes now a qualification for spiritual abuse? Yep. Yep. Spiritual religious abuse. Confidentiality. People might not know what DSM-5 is. Oh, you know what the DSM-5? is huh it's the bible for <laughs> it's the bible for psychology yeah it is the it is the book that establishes the psychological uh, qualification for diagnosis of mental health and illnesses so confidentiality confidentiality the respect for the confidentiality <coughs> of people. You know that is what that is confidentiality is the highest correlated item with patient satisfaction in healthcare. If they respect my confidentiality, I feel satisfied. The highest correlated satisfaction agent in patient satisfaction. And then respect for diversity or what we would call in chaplaincy Cultural humility. <coughs> Cultural humility. I saw a reaction here. What? What's that all about? Yeah, I just I, I love words and what that means is very significant because diversity is uh, former staff housekeeping here Adventist years ago would say talk to me and say that person is weird. Uh huh. Uh, and what makes the difference? Because, because they're different than than I or uh -huh. you. Uh huh. Cultural is is that's the world, and and we're not all going to be this. We all are not the same in this room. Background, favorite food, favorite music, what have you. Cultural what? Humility. humility. Cultural humility. I, 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 uh, with my wife, we spent a couple of years in Plow, South uh. Pacific. Uh -huh. Student missionary in Japan. Uh -huh. When you in another culture, yeah, you begin to realize that there are different ways of doing it uh -huh. that are not necessarily quote wrong, uh -huh. but also other ways that you will encounter that you will have a real hard time being humble, humble about. But it, it. Let me give you an example of this. That 
Um, last October, I am in Africa. I'm teaching a class in Adventist University of Africa. And Sabbath, I got invited to go preach at Nairobi Central Church. 5,000 members meet every, in every worship, and they have two worships. So 10,000 people every Sabbath go to that Nairobi Central Church. And the lady that came to pick us up at the Seventh-day Adventist compound took one look at my wife and said, you're doing children's story. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so we get to the church. And we are used to, here in North America and in Canada, you go to a church and they have internet. Right? So my wife takes her iPad, because she's supposed to tell the story of Daniel and the lion's den, and Spanish is her first language, English is her second language, and now she's going to ha have to be translated into Swahili. Mm -hmm. So she is like, she is freaking out. I need, to, I, need, I need the story, I need to find something. So I open the iPad to connect to the internet, and I see there are certain connections to the internet. And I go to the person that they assign, because they assign me one person to uh, you know, help me in anything. I go to the person, hey, I need the password for the internet. And he looked at me and said, Pastor, today is Sabbath. On Sabbath, we don't allow anybody in the internet. <laughs> uh, OK, but I think I can talk to the pastor and get permission for you to download the story. I understand what you're trying to do. I said, no, it's OK. I went back to my wife and said, you're going to have to do it by memory, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't want to be the one that comes and says, you're going to change your culture for me. Okay? So that was chaplaincy for the care recipients, regardless of who they are. Then care, chaplaincy for the organization. Care for the employees and affiliates. As a chaplain, man, how many time people came to me to complain about their boss? <laughs> and how many times I just wanted to go over there and cut the head off of that boss or that manager? But then I realized something interesting. I had as much responsibility to provide care for the person that came to give me the complaint, also to care for the person that I was being complained, that was being complained about. Because, I'm going to give you a little nugget of knowledge that I love. Behind every behavior, there's always a story. And the job of the pastor or the chaplain is to find that story. Find that story. So we provide care for employees and affiliates. We provide care for the organizations. And we provide care for the leaders. That's standard. And then maintaining competent chaplaincy care. That's the main, the, the, the keeping high standards of care, continuous quality improvement. Or what we would say at Advent Health now, continued cycles of improvement. Because every time you get to a place and you think you have, let me just say it the other, in another way. Is there any such thing as perfection on this side of eternity? So anytime you reach a moment of good standards, <coughs> You can always look back and because there's always something to improve on. So, continue cycles of improvement. Research. Research. I'll give you one more piece of this. Um, there's, a, there's a researcher in Yale by the name of Wendy Cage. She's an anthropologist. Brandeis. Huh? Brandeis. All right. <laughs> Thank you. She's an anthropologist. And she wrote a book entitled Paging God. Paging God. Where she did this research and she went and asked 1,500 chaplains, what is your number one tool of ministry? 
1,500 chaplains, the number one answer that came back was Ministry of Presence. Good, nice. That's the highest ranked tool of ministry and chaplaincy, Ministry of Presence. And then she went and she asked hospital administrators, medical directors, and nursing directors, what is your definition of Ministry of Presence? Okay? You know what was the number one answer the administrators, medical directors, and, chapl and nursing directors gave? Holy laziness. <laughs> Holy laziness. Holy. Holy laziness. Uh, at least they gave it the holy. <laughs> now, what is the ministry of presence? And why is it perceived by administration as holy laziness? Could it be that they don't know what chaplaincy is because we have not told them what it is? We have not demonstrated what it is? I did bedside chaplaincy for 16 years. I can't recall any time I was a holy lazy guy. <laughs> Seeing 30 to 40 patients a day, I wasn't, hold, I wasn't lazy. Having meetings and having interdisciplinary care notes and, and all that, I wasn't, I wasn't lazy. But my administrators didn't know. When you ask administrators, what is the work of a chaplain, many of them will tell you, just pray with patients. Before you move on. Yes. Uh, so this is an area that I have uh, in some of my slides that I did this morning. This is a real growing area of chaplaincy to make us a research-based organization uh, and profession that we're using evidence-based practices that we can demonstrate that what we do works. And one way, one reason why it's difficult is, as Ivan said earlier, chaplains aren't documenting. So we can't go back to the charts and see what chaplains did, what interventions did a chaplain do, what effect did that have, did it have an impact on the patient outcomes, because we haven't put it into writing. And there's no way to document it. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And so I'm the, I think, I think the only, no, I'm not the only nun pastor, but I am a nurse, right? And um, it depends on the model that is followed by chaplains or the organization. Um, my very first job many, many, many moons ago was in a place where there was an active chaplain and this was this was in Jamaica, this was in the early eighties and this was uncommon. But he would document. And there were nurses who would turn their noses up at him for documenting because in those days this whole notion of interdisciplinary care was not as well developed as it is now. But I've observed um, working in other organizations that for some chaplains, it's really a ministry of holy laziness, right? Because they will just come in and see one or two patients in a day, and that's it, mm -hmm. right? And they're all doing something else. So th there is some truth to that, and perhaps it's just a function of what's observed mm -hmm. as against uh, what, you know, is actually the desired situation. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and assert it. It is a result of what has been observed. Because, like Bill was saying, um, we still have a lot, a lot to learn about all this. I just, I, I was helping Bill earlier this year in January in New Mexico. Went to visit with a chaplain in New Mexico. She is a chaplain in the Veterans Affair Administration, and uh, the medical director of the of the women clinic, where she is doing her ministry, the medical director had, quote unquote, serious observations about the ethics of her documenting her visitation. 
we had to go over there and explain to that physician that if the, the, the chaplain did not document her visitation, nothing happened. And second, that there was a need for her, the physician, to see the charting of that, of that chaplain. Okay? Yeah, I was uh, discussing, you know, with, uh, we have in uh, Winnipeg here, because of course we are in transition period, and uh -huh. we we're discussing with uh, the regional, acting regional hospital here. There is still even a uh, struggle about documentation, because we have, of course, our MDS, we have uh, the MDS team, we have the outcome and the intervention, but again, uh, you know, it's a different model, mm -hmm. but then and the problem is how do you again revalidate it and how do you know reiterate it, you know, uh, things like that. So it's still even here in uh, Canada, it's still a growing discipline. It's still in every, everywhere, it's still a growing yeah. discipline. There is a need for re-evaluations, there is a need for communication of when a goal has been met, yeah. how do we move to another goal? All there, th remember, I go back here, continuous quality improvement. And Once you get to a place, you need to, okay, now we need to move to the next stage. And we need to move to the next stage because as long as we are on this side of eternity, there is no perfection. And also a clash between the quantitative and qualitative approach. Are yeah. you going to measure it quantitatively? The administrator says yes. We have to measure it, but from the spiritual care, how can you measure spirituality? It's qualitative. Um, it's both. Yeah, that's why we are that's, trying to get something that's hybrid. That's my that's doctoral quality. dissertation, by the way. Yeah, that's quality. Yes, sir. In order to ensure that holistic care is given, huh. speaking in terms of from a long-term care home, um, it is required that you record all your interactions. Mm -hmm. so if you do, um, physical therapy, mm -hmm. you need to charge that. If you do spiritual <laughs> therapy, you also need to record that. And so recording is very important so that you can um, identify what is being done. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> and very quick, very quickly here, technology. All right, let me be completely honest. I'm gonna close my eyes, not gonna look at anybody here or anything like that. I have very little patient, patience for chaplains who in the 20 years into the 21st century are still threatened by computers. <laughs> we are moving into a place where we even have electronic medical records. So charting is now done in the computer. So think about this. And then business acumen. Man, we need chaplains who are able to be business savvy. Who are able to make business decisions based on their spiritual and, and pastoral care. You need to get to a place where I where I sat with an administrator in a hospital that shall remain nameless. I'm not gonna say a word, uh, uh, the name of the hospital. But I sat with an administrator who told me to my face, he said, I would rather cut a doctor than a chaplain. <laughs> because the, the chaplain in that hospital was able to demonstrate to that administrator the business value of having chaplains. So they had 120 beds and they had five full-time chaplains. That chaplain had business acumen. I don't care how do you define it. <laughs> Questions? I think we've addressed some of that. So spiritual assessment. The pastor is a diagnostician. Very quickly, Benjamin Rush, after a, father of American psychiatry between 1745 and 1813. He said, a religion of some kind is as essential to the mind of man as air is to, resp to respiration. One more, Viktor Frankl. You know who that is, who that is right? 
Viktor Frankl, the famous psychiatrist that survived Auschwitz. No cure that fails to engage the spirit can make us well. Now, I was reading a little bit of information, and I understand that in Canada, the amount of people that claim to be spiritual but not religious has been growing in the last few years. Yes. Well, that's not only in Canada, that's been everywhere in the world. What's that all about? What's the difference between spiritual and religious? In, in fact, in our, in Park Manor Care, you know, the other one, uh, we have already included that in, in our custom made uh, spiritual care assessment. Okay. Because there are a, a number of them already there who claim to be like that, to be SBNR. What is interesting is, if I can maybe be completely and brutally honest with you, I've taken away completely from my spiritual assessment the identification of their religious beliefs. Yes. I've taken it away. Yeah, yes, yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. There are times when the conversation, and you will see that in some of the, the cases that we talk today, there are times when the conversation of spiritual matters is undergirded or is mm -hmm. even affected by their spiritual beliefs, mm -hmm. by their religious experience. But as a chaplain, my main responsibility is not to change their or to support their religion. My responsibility is to find what is their spiritual need. Are you with me? So I'm going to give you very simple ways that I've used to do this spiritual assessment thing. And this is, this, is, this is a quick example. We, when we don't forgive, our bodies manufacture potent chemicals like adrenaline, non, noradrenaline, uh, whatever that, you, you know, if you want to read that, hormone or cortisol. Over time, these chemicals can build up on the bloodstream, producing tension, vascular headaches, back pain, gastric ulcers, irritable, IBS, and even heart disease. So, what is a spiritual problem, forgiveness, becomes a physical problem. No wonder Sister White says that 90% of men's illnesses have a psychological or a spiritual... Are you with me? So is it important? How do we find then? So, spiritual assessment of hospital patients. The first step in assessing the spiritual patient is for the clinician to have a good knowledge of the patient's best basic moral and decision-making principles. Basics, moral and decision-making principles. In other words, what am I talking about? This is my spiel about spirituality. Are you with me? Remember Genesis chapter 1? When God created man? Remember that? What do we say it happened? What did God do? Bible says that God got his hands dirty, right? And formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, right? And then what did God do? <sighs> Breathe into his nostrils, and then he became? We are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe that when someone dies, what happens to the breath? goes back to God and the body stays there to decompose, right? So, breath, breathe, that is spirit. In Hebrew, rucha, in Greek, pneuma. Are you with me? So, my very simplistic way to define spirituality, spirit, is that which brings and sustains life. brings, sustains, gives meaning, whatever. The interesting thing about all this is that I can find spirituality even in the atheist. I can find spiritual needs even in the one who says, I'm agnostic. Because they do have spiritual needs. What are their spiritual needs? Where is it that they find meaning? And as a chaplain, I sit with them, I'm trying to find where is that meaning. 
And what were the two words again you said, which brings what and what? Sus brings and sustain meaning and life. Meaning and life. All right, I'm going to give you some examples of spiritual assessment qualifications. Does a spiritual connection exist? Does the patient verbalize a need to connect with his or her own spirituality and or spiritual support system? You know what, chaplain? I used to go to this church somewhere where they used to sing uh, I come to the garden alone. Man, that brought me so much peace. Let's sing it. I come to the garden. You sing it. You sing it. And then you, they were expressing a desire to connect with something that meant something important to them. Boom. Spiritual connection. Are you with me? Is it making sense? All right, next one, spiritual health, spiritual or health concern, spiritual health concern. Does the patient demonstrate anxiety regarding his or her hospitalization, illness, and or treatment plan? Does he or she have questions regarding his or her medical care or diagnosis? Uh, the doctor doesn't listen to me. That's the number one complaint in healthcare anywhere in the world. They don't listen. You ever read... Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before listening, that is his folly and shame. And if you want to have a little bit of fun with that, go to the Hebrew and find the original word for folly and shame. It's only one word. And it, it is the root of our word hemorrhoids. <laughs> you know where is a hemorrhoids? <laughs> A pain in the what? <laughs> so, patient is expressing anxiety regarding their hospitalization, their treatment, something. Then there may be some spiritual health concerns. You address those. Or maybe the patient, does the patient and our family exhibit spiritual beliefs? Do they express trust in God? Do they desire prayers and wish to participate in their own religious rituals? They need spiritual support. Notice, I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. We don't need to make things more complicated. Human beings are already complicated. We don't need to make them more complicated. Any question? I'm moving. Is the patient dealing with spiritual dilemmas? Does he or she struggle with the meaning of life and death? I, str uh, I, I suspect those of you who are in, ma in the manor here probably have a lot of these. People that are, you know, struggling with the meaning of life and death. Are there questions regarding God or a higher power? Are there spiritual dilemmas? I need to forgive or I need to be forgiven. You're in a you're in an ICU sitting with a patient that's about to die. And he looks at you and says, I can't die still, Pastor. Why? What's going on? What's happening? Tell me more. 20 years ago, I killed someone in Chicago. And that is a cold case. I think I need to make right. How do you deal with that? How do you help that person? Those are questions, those are important questions that we chaplains struggle with. So, there's probably a spiritual dilemma related with that. Or how about spiritual anxiety? Does he or she exhibit spiritual anxiety? Grief symptoms, complicated grief, grief. Complicated grief I'm talking about here. Spiritual depression and or alienation. I feel abandoned by my family. I feel abandoned by my church. Let's go back to that example with that physician who wanted to have that patient take some blood. That Jehovah Witness patient. 
there is some spiritual anxiety there. Why? Because if I take this blood, I can fit easily. He's, you think they don't know that this is very simple, fixable? They know. They can look around and they can see the other people who don't believe the same thing they believe, who get well and they leave the hospital very well, no problem. So they know that. But they, are, they have this huge fight within themselves. So there's spiritual anxiety there. There's spiritual dilemmas in there. there are, so how do we scratch where it itches? How do we process that? How do we sit down with someone who sees the train of death coming to them on a daily basis and tells you, I am afraid to go to sleep at night because I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. So how do you hold the space for them? And hold the tension of that statement. Because you want to save their lives, don't we? Don't you? But you can't. So how do you hold that? That's part of the spiritual assessment that you follow. Or is the patient encountering spiritual suffering? Does he or she demonstrate spiritual withdrawal? Loss of hope and belief and or feelings of despair? Maybe you get called to provide spiritual crisis intervention. There is an accident, an emergency, something that was not planned. How do you respond to that? How do you go and be with a family after they have lost their baby after one month? <laughs> or me, I hate, I, I used to hate summers in Florida. Not only because of the 125 degrees heat, plus 100% humidity, that's one thing. But I also hated summers because it meant people being uncareful with their pools. And every summer we had between 20 and 25 baby drownings. I still hold one of the worst records any chaplains in Adventist health can have. I had five baby drownings in one 24-hour shift. Mm -hmm. By the time I got the fifth get kid, I called somebody else to come. I couldn't take one more. Because I was angry at the families I was supposed to provide ministry for. So, spiritual crisis intervention. How do we, does an emergency or life-threatening situation exist? Is withdrawal of life support an issue? Is the patient near death or comatose? How do we respond to that? How do we provide support for the family? How do we support, provide support for the patient if that is available, if that is possible? How do we provide support for the staff? Especially in places like this. They have been caring for that lady, for that old lady for a year. And then she dies on them. They may be on the outside very stoic. We got to move on to the next one. But there are some needs deep inside them that need to be addressed. And the chaplain needs to be observant of those and needs to approach them. That physician who works on a patient for an hour, two hours, when the patient is already dead. Where is that coming from? How's the chaplain goes and approaches that physician? Because that physician may be having a spiritual crisis in, and needs your intervention. And then the last, but certainly not least, there may be people that believe what you preach. They may, there may be people that believe what we say, we do, and so they really don't have any needs. What's happening? Tell me more. What these reactions, Bill? Well, they may uh, believe what you believe, but they still have all these questions. Life is still going on. Mm -hmm. Be a seventh day Adventist and have issues. Uh huh. Well, there's, there's no human being. There's no human being 
without spiritual being. All right. There is no human being without spiritual needs. What I'm trying to say here is that maybe at that moment when you show up, they're not really interested in following anything with you. So there's, this is the moment when I am, as a chaplain, I am capable of saying, okay, I'm leaving you in the hands of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will provide for you the next person available. Then prayer, prayer can be uh, uh, a need of that person. That. Yeah, prayer may be. They, but the, also the patient may say, no, I, I really don't want you to pray. So you have to give them the space to say, okay, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to go out of that room and outside the door, I'm going to send a good, pr a short prayer up to heaven. Please, Lord, be with them. They may not realize it, but they need you. Yes, sir. I, I discovered that um, sometimes in the most trying times, people don't need to hear a word from you. Uh -huh. It might be that you just need to be present, uh -huh. or you might just need to give them some space to breathe, but let them know that, okay, I, I, I will be praying for you, or if you need me and just a phone call away, and that alone can be an icebreaker, so it will open the door. And so sometimes it doesn't really make sense to pray. Mm -hmm. but just leave them with an open door that, hey, I'm right there for you. And the door will open for you to intervene at other times. Thank you very much. I'm closing with this, with this uh, uh, illustration. Um, <clears throat> In 2008, in the, in the United States, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, which is the highest uh, insurance in the nation, decided that they were going to change the way they reimbursed hospitals and healthcare facilities based not only on clinical outcomes. In other words, let me give you a quick example of that. If I came to the hospital in the United States and I had chest pain, I went to the ER, emergency department, and I said I had chest pains, in order for the hospital to get reimbursed by Medicare, they had to provide proof to Medicare that when I said I had chest pains, within 30 minutes they had to give me an, uh, an EKG and, a, and, a, and an aspirin. So if they gave, the hospital gave that patient the EKG and the aspirin within 30 minutes, they got paid. Are you with me? Starting 2008, they said, okay, 60% of what you are going to receive is based on giving them the EKG and the aspirin. 40% of what you're going to receive is depending on how you treat the patient when you give them the aspirin and you give them the EKG. So in 2013, when this thing came live, in August of 2013, Florida Hospital in the Orlando area, you know the biggest hospital we have in the nation, in that place, in one month, they lost $30 million in revenue. 40%, boom, dropped. Everybody went crazy. Because the process to identify how satisfied patients were was established by a survey that got sent via mail to everyone in the hospital and there were 28 questions in that survey. Question number 21 of those 28 questions reads the, the following way. Degree to which the hospital staff address your spiritual and emotional needs from one to five. That became the way they were evaluating the chaplain's department with that question. Everybody went crazy, and people started saying a lot of things. I, was, I became member of a bunch of meetings, a bunch of committees, and all that, and I heard it all. I had to pray with every patient. I had to give everybody a Bible. I had to do this. I had to do that. I, I mean, I heard it all. Everybody was crazy. Why? Because remember, for now it's hitting the pocket. Hitting the pocket. So I said to my administrator, hold it. Before we go anywhere, Let's just give voice to need, who needs to have a voice. 
give me one month. I went and I asked 200 patients, what comes to your mind when we ask you about your spiritual and emotional needs? That's, all the, that's the question I asked. What's com what comes to your mind? Did you know, for example, that four out of 200 patients said prayer? And the information that they gave us was valuable, valuable. What we gleaned out of that, I'm, I can share with you some more of that uh, later on. That's part of my doctoral dissertation. But what we glean out of that is that patients were evaluating the whole experience from beginning to end. And I was able to find something interesting. I was able to find, I found, I was able to put numbers into this. Okay. And I found that as long as I saw 70% of the patients before they left the hospital with what I called a discharge blessing, as long as I hit 70%, my numbers in the spiritual question was, were in the 90th percentile. So 90% of the patients that responded the spiritual question gave us a 5 as long as I visited with 70% of them before they left and I gave them a discharge blessing. You know what was interesting? I did that for three years until I left. And here's the important thing. In three years, offering patients a discharge blessing, even when they said only four out of 200 said that prayer would be important for them, in three years, only two patients declined the blessing. I even had a young man who said, I'm an atheist, but I would like the blessing. <laughs> and you know what I did in that blessing? I, I made my own version of the ironic blessing in the Old Testament. May God bless you and keep you. May God shine his face upon you. May you never get sick again. May you never need to come back to the hospital. And if you ever need to come back to the hospital, we are here for you. Awesome. <laughs> that changed the perception. And so we had numbers that connected pastoral care with high standard results. Uh, we have three more minutes. Questions? Concerns? Yes, sir. Are you willing to share some of that? Uh, yes, 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 yes. I will share. I will share. Um, I send it to the people that are doing the, the video, and I'll be more than happy to share. Matter of fact, if some of you have apples, I can airdrop it right now. I have a peach. Huh? I have a peach. Not <laughs> Sorry, you have a toy. You don't have a computer. <laughs> I hear you saying that you have some uh, issues about standards of uh, computing. Oh, yeah, I do. I do. I do. Some have greater needs than others. All right, all right, all right, all right. More questions? All right. All right, David. Uh, gee. I'm sending it to everyone. Okay. Sending it to everyone. Spiritual assessment of persons with. Uh, <clears throat> Cognitive impair. For me, it all started in some of the things that I observed. The first year, I was a chaplain. I was actually a chaplain in a nursing home. And there were many patients that could not carry a conversation. There were many patients that had, had, um, Cognitive impaired, that were cognitive impaired. How did I do some of that? 
first thing I did is I started to do some create, find some creative ways to observe. In a spiritual assessment and diagnosis, observations are most important. As a nurse, you know this. Patient may not be able to tell you that they have a physical need, but there is a way they communicate, not with the words, but in other ways. So as a chaplain, I learned to observe some of those things. Um, I'm going to need to be a little bit more specific later in, in some other ways we do this. Um, I, for example, I had, I had a, a patient with, that had a stroke and she had aphasia. And so, which means she only had one word that came out of her mouth, but I could see that she knew what she was trying to say. So the way I addressed that is I gave her a piece of paper. And so she wrote some of, thing, of her things. And what I found out is that the, it was very important for her that she would have some time to t share stories with her grandchildren. And so I was able to give them coloring books and things like that and provided for an opportunity for grandma and her grandchildren to share on a coloring time. And during that coloring time, I was able to glean so many things about this family and about her. So that's, that's probably one of the ways, in the creative ways, that you, that you can connect with people like that. Yeah. Who have means that, that the, the, the process of assessing someone with cognitive impairment may be a time yeah, it will be longer. It will be. It's not May. It will be. Over here. What we did at Park Manor is that uh, we designed another assessment tool for the next of kin. <coughs> this it could be something like a sort of background. So aside from the assessment tool used by me, mm -hmm. then we designed another one for the next of kin. You can tell us more. I would be cautioned to call that assessment. I would call that screening. Because a screening, uh, an assessment is performed by someone that is um, trained, yeah. someone that has the licensure to provide that. Yeah, yeah. The screening gives you ideas as to where to go in your assessment. But yeah, that is but, good. But the way we design it, it's not more of screening thing. It's really need identification. There you go. Yeah, that's what we need. So, Perfect. Yeah. There is, um, for those who are in um, long-term care, there is a new um, technology, the um, mark system that we have been using at Sunnyside to gather um, information about our residents. And what we also have done is we have a, a my story that we have expanded so that we are able to capture enough data to see what their needs are and how to best address those spiritual needs as well. So you see, there are some, once again, there are some tools that we can use to build upon or, you know, it went in my relationship with physicians and with nurses and with staff, my screening question is, are you finding hope today? And that, boom, that uncorked, that would uncork something that would, or I, I had a lot of fun going into places and asking, so how are you today? And normally people would say, fine. <laughs> and then I would say, you know what fine stands for? No, chaplain, what does it stand for? Freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> that was the reaction. But immediately after that, there was conversations. Thank you very much, guys. I've taken four minutes beyond your time. Circle of Hope Network. Doing life and being church together.